Hi there, welcome to the second episode of Super 8, a film review show which looks at one new release film, two retro films and squishes them together in intriguing ways. Unless this is the first episode you've seen, in which case, welcome to your first episode. Anyway, my name's Lauren Bedicchini. And I'm Kai Perignon. Tonight on Super 8, we look at a music documentary of sorts in Whitney, Can I Be Me? In keeping with the theme of music docos and people named Whitney, in our retro review section, I'll take a look at Zachary Overzen's Tell Me Love Is Real for reasons that will become clear, hopefully. Then Lauren will take a look at Julian Temple's music documentary on 1970s punk neophytes The Sex Pistols in The Filth and the Fury. But first off, Whitney, can I be me? Lauren? Yes, Kai. You can. You can only be you, but that's fine. You're a good man. <laughs> Now to the movie. You know, probably doesn't even matter anyway. Whitney, Can I Be Me is a postmortem. Anyway. The documentary by Nick Brookfield and Rudy Dolzal draws heavily on footage shot during Houston's 1999 world tour, which saw her retreat into semi-retirement and eventually rehab. It uses this moment in her life as an avenue to explore her past and explain her future. The film spends a lot of time setting up the range of tensions surrounding Houston and her vulnerability which left her unable to deal with them. From Houston's working class upbringing and young drug use alongside her squeaky clean image, her possible affair with longtime female friend Robin, the employment of her family, her rejection by the black community, her relationship with Bobby Brown and her destructive drug habits enabled by the people surrounding her. At times, watching the documentary can feel like being pulled in five different directions by the competing forces in Houston's life. And a more interesting film would have done something with this to better echo the artist's experience. It's undeniably exciting to hear concert footage of Houston perform, and it's interesting to consider her responses to moments like being booed at the Soul Train Awards. Female but eventually the film settles into a rhythm the of talking screen. head and archival footage more deifying Houston and laying the blame for her demise everywhere but with her. This feels like a missed opportunity to do something really interesting with Houston's story, which is largely well known by this film's audience. Kai? Uh, yeah, this is, um, uh, this is a movie. You know, it's competently made, it's well produced. But I question what drew the filmmakers to Houston as a subject, beyond the obvious celebrity and drama. Uh, Broomfield and the Liesel don't really seem to have an opinion on Houston or problems. It's also superficial and in a way that feels strangely exploitative. This isn't just a celebration of Houston's art. It's not a pure fluff piece. This film is seemingly obsessed with her pain, but it never questions it, never probes Houston's psychology in any meaningful way. There are a few moments here that suggest a more interesting work. Home video footage of Houston and Brown recreating Tina and Ike Turner's domestic strife. Laughing as they play dress up, pops up early on, and it's a strange, powerful scene. But then we get another talking head. Yeah, I found the talking heads pretty stuffy. Yeah, listen, I don't they didn't care about this movie. <laughs> it's probably bad for the people providing us with screeners, but I, I did really care. I, I, I am not somebody who is into Houston or has ever been particularly interested in her music. Her voice is amazing. Of course. No denying that. It's beautiful, but I couldn't agree with you more when you were saying that the film scene's obsessed with her pain. It just feels like a rehashing and a rehashing and a rehashing. And it doesn't really feel like there's any space for Whitney Houston in there. Absolutely. It's titled, Can I Be Me? But the movie is like, no, you can be everybody else's <laughs> opinion of you. Absolutely. And that's about it. Exactly, and it's so, it's so strange to see that in a documentary, which it, it, it feels so slight at times, and yet it's just, it's just, it's a, mis it's a miserable way to get there. It's, it's a short movie, it's only like, what, 128 minutes, but it's, mm. that's no, only like an hour and 20 minutes. But 
I, I mean, the best thing I'd say about it is that afterwards, I just I listened to I Want to Dance with Somebody like a bunch of times. I did agree that the stuff with Ike oh, and Tina Turner was really good. Whitney insisted they crossed her back over the black music. I'm Your Baby Tonight it was not a record that Clive Davis wanted to make. But she says, I'm not making another record like you want. I'm going to do me now. This week, the theme was supposed to be music documentaries, but I insist on doing something else because I'm tough to work with. So while Lauren does her job properly, my pick is the third film by micro-budget filmmaker slash playwright Zachary Overzan, 2016's Tell Me Love Is Real. As we know, in the winter of 2012, Whitney Houston overdosed on Xanax. Around the same time, so too did Zachary Overzan, though he survived. His near-death experience makes Oberzen reevaluate his life, especially in light of the bizarre coincidence of Houston's death. He contemplates. Houston sang songs of love but died without it. And so he asks, is sincerity a viable way of living? Is love simply a construct? The film is essentially a document of a mixed media performance uh, Oberzen has been touring around Europe for a while. Monologue, song, documentary, video clips, that sort of thing though the final product is woven together cinematically and intuitively, justifying its format. Tell Me Love is Real is ultimately about closing the distance between what love offers and what it can really achieve in a cynical world. Oberzen layers video and live performances over each other, often simultaneously, attempting and failing to bridge the gap between the two, just as Houston seemed to try to bridge singing about love and enacting it in her own life. While the premise reeks of narcissistic exploitation, Tell Me Love is Real gradually reveals itself as a genuine plea for connection, a startlingly humanistic work that feels as raw and as beautiful as anything I've ever seen. It's also funny and features Jean-Claude Van Damme's mom. You can buy Tell Me Love is Real on Oberzan's website. So obviously you're a big fan. Oh, I love this movie. Yep, and to be honest, you've pretty much sold it to me. Anything that's a little bit meta and is talking about itself, in itself, I'm into. That's all, it's good, yeah. And I am interested in the idea of love as a construct. Um, so it sounds, in, it sounds interesting to me. It sounds like something I would love to, to it's, see. It's worth checking out, and you can, you can, you can, it's really cheap on his website. I found out about Oberzan because a couple years ago, he made this movie called Flooding with Love for the Kid, which was an adaptation of the novel that Rambo is based on, but he did it playing every character in his one room apartment for like $95, and it's incredible. It's, an, it's, I mean, it's ridiculous, but it's incredible. Um, and it's this beautiful work of like about art, artist and art and kind of the strange relationship that is, and he's stunning. I would be remiss if I didn't mention one problematic aspect of this film, because I'll, I'll get yelled at if I don't probably. The very beginning, Oprah like does a monologue as Houston, and he kind of like, half does blackface. Oh. Like, I'm not sure how much, it, it's like, it, I don't know. Like, it's one of those things right. where I'm like, I, it's semi, I, it's, I don't know. Um, so if you watch it, does don't it, yell at me for not mentioning does that. Does doing that in any way affect the tone of the rest of the film? No, no, it feels like you can just, you can justify it. It's not like full on, it's, it, it's, it's, it's such a strange, it's, it's a beautiful monologue as right. Houston, and it's really powerful and, and like great stuff. So did he write the monologue? Yeah. Okay, so, so it's wrote, not lifted from anything. No, she it's said. not like he's reenacted because it's it's ostensibly a monologue from like her last moments. Right. Um, and it's it, it, and that's like the moment where early on where you go, man, is this going to be that exploitative? And it is because he's mining right. his own he's mining his own connection out of her death. Yeah. But I, I think from that it moves on, and you realize the point of it. Um, it's just there's a moment early on where I'm like, uh, I I, mm. I do not know. So watch it and don't yell at me um, <laughs> because I don't know. Is it's, that a big ask? I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, hey. Yeah, good point. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> so hey, uh, okay. Look at you one last time. Our new release this week has opened up a possibility for Kai and I to explore films that we're into, however tenuous their connection to Whitney Can I Be Me. For me, this means diving into another heady, tragic train wreck musician story with Julian Temple's 2000 documentary. The Filth and the Fury, which charts the rise and demise of the Sex Pistols. Most of these groups will be vastly improved. The film by firmly the positions the band in and Sex responding Pistols to and the social and economic climate of London in the mid to late 1970s. Anti establishment, anti consumerist, pro worker. The band has a philosophy that members connect to in a greater or lesser degree, but mostly it's adhered to by Johnny Rotten. 
Temple uses frenetic collage of archival footage, TV programming, Shakespearean shows and historical reenactments to highlight the tensions between the working class reality and the projected majesty of Great Britain. These sequences are intercut with the weakest and the strongest elements of the film. Static, dark and visually pointless talking heads and fabulous animated sequences illustrating the stories that are being recounted by the members. The aim of this 2000 documentary is, according to the director Julian Temple, to allow the band to speak for themselves amid the huge amount of academic and tabloid coverage. Despite this, Temple has used the documentary form in a range of ways to illuminate his position, letting archival footage paint Nancy herself as a divisive force and also juxtaposing footage which serves to condemn Malcolm McLaren's efforts to use the band as a part of his situationist art project. Who are the villains here? Where does the film lay the blame for the band's disintegration? It seems, according to Temple, that it's Malcolm McLaren, heroin and a philosophy which defined itself against the type of faddish conformity it would unwittingly produce. What are your thoughts on the Sex Pistols, Kai? Listen, I like the Sex Pistols, but I do find punk as a movement basically insufferable. And mm. every, and I've seen a few documentaries on punk scene, and every single one has caused me a lot of trouble to watch. I feel like it's a scene that worked until it became a scene. And then as soon <laughs> as it did, it did not work. That's actually, I mean, yeah, to a certain point, like, uh, yeah, I think it, only, it works when it's not like a consumer subject. As soon as you can buy music or pay yeah. for their shows, I don't think it really makes sense anymore. Yeah. But the thing I would like to really talk about with this film is those, those lovely little animated sequences. I feel like it really helped to um, sort of contrast the playful elements of the Sex Pistols because mm -hmm. I think when we're thinking about the um, out of control nature of the Sex Pistols, mm -hmm. it was really playful mm. until they got to America. Yeah. Yeah. And are the anime sequences are like, I'm imagining this being rough. I should have watched this movie. Uh, but I'm imagining this being like quite rough and like, you know, shot, not shoddy, but like real gritty animated stuff. And it's not too gritty. It's, it's, it's quite cartoonish. Quite cartoonish. Yeah. yeah. But, um, I'm going to show a clip right I, now. I <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Redundancy. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but I just, I, I like that technique mm -hmm. in documentary to yeah. sort of take us there. And I feel like it's really nice highlighting the subjectivity of what's being told to you mm. as well. That's absolutely fair. I yeah, think about that through one. that technique. Uh, would you give it a hearty recommendation? Um, look, I really like music from that era. Mm -hmm. I, if you have any passing interest in punk, post-punk, sure, definitely see it. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot to get out of this film other than just being a fan of the Sex Pistols. Um, so yeah, I would. I guess the, the downfall would be those talking heads, which yeah. were, they looked like, you know, a disgruntled employer from ACA. <laughs> they looked like somebody in witness protection. They were really that's, bad. That, I'm trying to think of a way that- That's actually selling it more like, to me. I want to see like angry employees <laughs> talking about punk, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm kind of trying to like think my way through how they fit into it, but I think I'm clutching at straws there. I don't, the, I don't know what was going on. Maybe but. the most punk thing at this point is the least punk It's so thing. funny because it's like they're trying to obscure their identity, but it's still like they've got their name at the bottom. It's like Johnny <laughs> Rotten and it's just silhouette. Yeah, interesting. I actually want to see the movie way more now just to see these really confusing talking heads. Maybe it's about not wanting them to age, still wanting to identify with them as they were in the 70s. Yeah, but like Johnny 70s. Rotten's name is Johnny Rotten. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I'm not going to be like... Actually, I can't remember. Maybe in the film he's John Lydon. I'm not sure. We're all learning things today. We are. God save the Queen, eh, hey, John? <laughs> That's all we've got time for this episode, but we hope you enjoy the show and join us again next week. Otherwise, I hate to think what might happen. I really do. Special thanks to Rialto Distribution, the AFI, Cinema Nova, and RMIT for the film. Thanks for watching Super 8. Good night. Good night! Right? Mm. <laughs> <laughs>